Let's talk about the spiritual lessons from the lingering possum. Welcome to Kingdom of the Logos, a Christian program of critical thinking and adventure produced by clergy in the Church of the Nazarene. And I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor, and here with me in the studio is, of course, Pastor Anthony Alegria. All right, now, today we have a guest missionary speaker from a Creative Access area, so we're not putting any of that online, but... We are going to talk about a really interesting story we had. We don't really talk a lot about stories, but something that had a lot of revelatory significance to us. Um, and that was a possum that lingered a bit too long. Also, um, I've been referring to him as Beelzebub, and I think that's a pretty accurate thing. Many of us out here in the country, we've been around dead animals and stuff. Today, Anthony and I are just going to share with you a little bit of a revelation that we had. Anthony, I don't know if you want to, to start off on all this. I know today's conversation is going to be a little bit different. Um, do you want to set people up with the history of this, or would you rather that I? Well, why don't you um, set up the preemptive uh, parts of the story? Well, let, yeah, let's do that. Let's actually start it from thousands of years ago. So our ancient predecessors, they understood that there were things in the world explainable and things which were kind of mysterious. Our ancient predecessors, they understood that dead bodies have insects around them. And oftentimes these insects, whether they be something like hornets or just flies, gnats, whatever, uh, maggots, you know, really gross stuff, they, they often carry diseases. And they had a word for this. They actually had a name for the disease-riddled swarm of insects on a dead body, on a dead carcass, and that was Beelzebub. Um, Beelzebub, Beelzebub, however you want to pronounce that in English, it's not an English word, but Beelzebub is the disease-riddled demon on a swarm of insects that's on a dead body. And one of the things about that is it's something which is a perfectly explainable phenomenon. And our ancient people who come before us, they knew that it was something you can explain. You know, it's unhealthy. Don't touch it. It's unclean. You know, by Jewish law, it's unclean to touch this stuff. But at the same time, while there was an explainable side to it, they also said there's something about this which is demonic. There is a conscious evil here, something unborn to creation, something that was never part of, of God's spoken order. And this week, um, even though many of us have been around, uh, you know, animals that have died, we had a interesting problem in the church. And the reason why this is so revelatory is because there was a, a figurative side of this and a literal side of this. So about a week ago, different things were going on. Um, I know even I was susceptible to some bad temperament issues. There was um, just this general, I don't know. Things were not going so well in the life of the church this week. And Monday when we had come in the building to, to go on top of that, there was a wretched stink. And we had assumed that like a mouse or something had got in one of the air ducts and, and died. And we hunted and hunted and couldn't find it. Um, and we, we spent several like days trying to figure out where the source of this problem was. And as the week progressed, we started to realize that it was in fact in the crawl space. That was one of the first places that we checked. But for one reason or another, we couldn't really find that anything was there. However, we did in fact find that Beelzebub was with us, this ancient demon. It was a literal phenomenon of a swarm of insects, disease-riddled swarm of insects on a dead body, but also the, the, the mysterious, you might say the paranormal side of things. Um, Anthony, what did, what did you find when you went into the crawl space the other day, and, and what did we learn from this? Well, I'll say this much. Um, you know, this was a stink that we were all facing, and obviously... Uh, we don't want that happening on service days and things like that. So, um, And it sounds we like all... there's a spook here. I don't know what's going on a few other rooms in the church. Somebody's beating something. Um, but yes, continue. In any case, so it's a big deal uh, trying to solve this stink issue. And we didn't know where it was. We couldn't find it up to this point. And so I was sent under to crawl around under the crawl space and find it wherever it was. And so, um, and it has great power over you, by the way, again, there, the reason why we, I want us to tell this is there's a great parallel between the stink of the lingering opossum. And again, I say opossum, there's a different creature, which is the possum. And I actually, the Didelphus virginianus, which we know commonly as the opossum. Um, I usually pronounce the O. I think there's actually quite a few people who do that to differentiate it from the other creature, um, which is not in North America. Um, but this stink. It has power over you, sort of like evil comes to have power over you. You know, it gets you when, when you're you're low, when things are kind of depressing. Um, I lost my dog last um, week, a week and a few days ago, 
and you know you're kind of down you're kind of sad about things and then evil comes in to prey on you evil is often depicted as a predator and it comes to have power over you we weren't able to have church in the sanctuary wednesday because of this and again we're not like some nasty building here we try to keep things reasonably clean but when you're out in the country this sort of thing happens and of course maybe if you're city dwellers things can happen to you there but yeah evil comes to have a power over you just sort of like the stink of something it comes to linger to prey on you when when things are not going so great but anthony you may continue so in any case yeah the stink is very very powerful and um before i went under there dylan was literally telling me about beelzebub and things like that and so i was connecting it with this idea of you know stench evil and dirtiness, you know, all being connected, evil and dirtiness being connected. In an inexplicable sort of the flip way. side of um, cleanliness being next to godliness. Yeah. And so I was thinking about that whenever I was going under there. It took me a while to find it, even though it was in a really obvious place. But I will say that... Um, what were your thoughts going under there? I know you had said you were prepared to be the, the hero that goes and slays the beast. Yeah, that's sort of what uh, what I was thinking going under there. You know, it's not like... It wasn't about like people knowing and things like that, but I was ready to like tackle this demon that was, you know, um, taking over the church and especially something that could make our services worse. I was ready to get rid of that, you know, and so I was ready to tackle this problem. And then the problem was before me. I'll say this much. I've never been so unexcited to find anything I was looking for in my life. It was absolutely awful. Um, I'm not going to get into the details, but... It was the most disgusting thing I've ever handled before in my life. And it took me, honestly, a few minutes just to work up the, uh, I guess, courage and fortitude to con- to continue handling it. I was contemplating silently to go and get Dylan to come do it now that I had found it. It was so bad. Um, but I did end up handling it. And afterwards, after I had handled it, um, which, by the way, I, this is sort of a uh, on a different note, but I do thank God that I did not eat that day because it was – my food yeah, would have been and- everywhere. But anyways, um, <clears throat> so I get it cleaned up, uh, and then I come out, and I'm thinking about how I was going to think about it later on or how I would have thought about it. And I realized that the price it cost – to clean up the church and to get rid of that evil was so expensive that I almost didn't even want to celebrate what I had done, like the small accomplishment I had made. You know, I was most of the time after you get finished doing something like that, you know, you found the thing which was um, taking over and sort of uh, making you its prey. And so you're really excited, you should be anyways, that you have overcome it. But it was the price was so high that well, see, it really took away a lot of my excitement. Was it a lot of times we look at something and be like, oh, the price for that's too and the price was exactly what it had to be. Like dealing with things that are wicked or nasty. And again, if you look to a lot of the ancient traditions which come before us, there is a connection with being unclean and being not right before God. I know Anthony said, you know, I have to pray for forgiveness just for touching this um, remains of an opossum. But there, there is something to that. And, you know, we don't spend a lot of time talking about things that are spiritual in the sense of things which we can't explain, especially in sort of the, the theology that we talk around here at Kingdom of the Logos. But there is something ancient about the idea that if it is filthy, it is not the form which God created it to be. And as we know from even our own scriptures, God did not create creation to be in the perpetual state of death and decay. Like the opossum, the breath of life has escaped its body. Like, you know, when my, my little dog passed, and many of you got to see Charlie the church history dog, and don't get me worked up on that one. Um, Charlie lived a very long, very good life. But, you know, once the breath of life left him, you know, it would be insane for me to, like, stuff him and keep him inside as if he were the same. Um, realistically, when the breath of life leaves something, it, it returns to God, and God would not create um, so that something could be eternally separated from him. And you're not going to find that breath of life anywhere in this universe. Like, it, it, it returns to God, and that's the only thing that can happen. That's the only hope for something. But with this opossum, it kind of reminds you that the default state of fallen creation, now that sin is entered in, it's death and decay. Like, our bodies will turn to a very 
unclean state very quickly once the breath of life leaves us, just as they will with that opossum. And while it seems like a huge price price to come to that, um, it is the exact right price. Dealing with evil, dealing with things of wickedness, it comes at a high price and usually so high that, you know, when it's all said and done, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't even feel like celebrating. But even when Christ comes to overcome death, it comes at an extraordinarily high price. It's not all glamorous and, and glorious. A lot of times Hollywood lets us see these adventures with heroes and things. And, you know, it's all wonderful at the end. But when you actually deal with a real problem in real life, you find out that, you know, I'm just so exhausted I want to be done. Um, yeah, you pretty much, <laughs> the fantasy of handling a problem is over. You're like, I never want to have to handle a problem again. But you will. Yeah, and the thing with Beelzebub, and that's what we've been calling him, because, again, Beelzebub is this ancient demon, and or it's the name of an ancient demon. I'm not here to say whether or not Beelzebub exists in, in the way that a lot of times people conceptualize things. But there is a literal understanding of, of Beelzebub, and then there's the, the spiritual understanding of De- Beelzebub. Like you can say definitively, we know that dead bodies are, are nasty in the sense that you get this opossum out. He's, he's reduced down to like nothing. He's like a soup now. Um, and Anthony had put him in a bag and kind of sealed it up. He was in several layers of bags. I came out there and put him in a couple of layers of trash bags and had each one taped up and sealed up. And we, we were trying to figure out what to do with it. We eventually um, got him in a, a nice grave. Um, we'll put it that way. He was buried deep, so he's he's gone. Nobody will ever find him again. But when um, the stink was permeating throughout, it was something which everyone kind of knew and was affected to, like you're under its power. And the thing with Beelzebub and the idea that this sort of evil is unborn, like even if we took care of this particular corpse, like the reality of the disease-riddled swarm of insects on a body, you know, that's going to appear somewhere else. Something like Beelzebub, it does not have to be born. It doesn't enter into creation in the conventional sense. It is literally a byproduct of the death and decay, which is a product of the sin and the fallen state of, of creation. You know, sin actually has ramifications, which allows these sort of demons to manifest. And watching the opossum in the whole situation. And we have the greatest voicemail of all time that I'm going to share here in a minute. Um, dealing with this and the voicemails you get regarding the stink, they are hilarious, but at the same time, they're primal. They teach you this is really how creation works. Um, Anthony, I know you had something to, to respond back to that a little bit. but um, Well, I'll just say one thing. I got a few things to say, but I'll say this and then I'll let you uh, play that voicemail. Um, but in any case, I will say that there are things which are not sin that you feel the need to pray for forgiveness for, and that was definitely one of those situations. But it was unclean. Cleaning up that possum. Yeah, De- it was Definitively unclean. unclean. That's and, not the state um, God wanted us to be in. Definitely before I got involved with it, I was like, God, I'm, like, I'm literally handling this for your church, but please forgive me for what I'm about to do uh, in cleaning that up. It was, you know, that wretched and um, I think there's a lot of things in life that are like that, where it's not necessarily a sin, but you know, this is not the way things are supposed to be, but that this is what I got to do. <laughs> well, let's talk about the thing, way things were meant to be before I play this voicemail. So just hold on with this for the voicemail. I know we're just having a bit of a, a chit chat here. Um, I wanted to read from the Gospel of Matthew. This is where I preached from last Wednesday, the whole abracadabra, Satan in the wilderness, or the, de- the devil, the diabolical one in the wilderness. The, the tempter came to him and said, this is Matthew 4, 3. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, he being Jesus, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, I took and translated that because when we read that in English, you kind of get, you know, the devil is kind of trying to get this bit of a parlor trick. He, he says, you know, just say abracadabra and get you some bread there. But really, it's a little bit deeper than that because there's a, a hina clause there in the Greek, and he's really the, the devil is trying to get Jesus to create a new created order. Yeah, he's trying to break the human ritual of just fasting. He wants the petty things, but he wants the grand things too. And I translate this passage as following from the Greek. If you are the Son of God, speak into existence a new order, where stone becomes bread. Verse 4, But he answered, saying, One does not live by bread alone, but by everything said out of the mouth of God. And 
really the devil is saying, why don't you put a new order where life is sustained off of rocks, essentially? And Jesus goes back, and he doesn't even talk about stones or bread. He just says, one does not live by bread alone. In other words, food does not sustain you. Food is not the source of life. But everything that came out of the mouth of God, and it's not actually logos that's found there, um, logos word, but it is the kind of utterances, the the declarations, the message, the the collective aggregate of the product of God's mouth is essentially what he's saying. And the breath of life came from God. The breath of life didn't come from stone. The breath of light didn't come from something else. And we are quickly reminded with something like this opossum, when you see it, that, yeah, the breath of life, it comes from God. And once it slips and it goes back to, to God, our only hope is found in God. That's the only way we'll ever return to, to life. That's where the resurrection is. And we have great assurance in that. So when we've lost loved ones and, and we know that their body no longer houses their their soul, we can have great assurance in saying that it went back to God because God is the giver of life. Um, but yeah, when we see Beelzebub come, Beelzebub will return again. Um, not in the same way that Christ will return because Christ is holy and clean and Christ is the, the Lord of Lords. The, he sits there with the master of the universe. And, you know, that's a powerful thing. It has the ability to breathe in the breath of life, where something like Beelzebub, it manifests in death. And it has power over you, but yet it can be defeated. Um, it is petty. It is small. It just wants to stink and take you out of the sanctuary like it did with us. It, um, and that's how evil works on your soul. Something comes, it may be a bad temperament. A lot of times people make habits of bad attitudes, and they have their excuses. They have their individual motives. But usually a bad habit of temperament causes a lot more problems than the actual circumstances. Mature people can handle situations well, but evil, it wants to prey on you. Anyways, let's take a little bit lighter note. I have a voicemail from um, the groundskeeper who was here at the church, and he was he knew that we had been dealing with this animal, and this is just great. So let me just play this. Yeah, I have to do something similar to that child guy here, but I ain't heard from out the sign the way in the right direction. They drink. <laughs> yeah. And he's saying you have to do something different with that skunk out here. Um I can smell it plumb out to the sign if the wind's in the right direction. It's rank. I'll play it again for you so you can you can hear that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll play it one more time, Anthony. Yeah, I'm do something similar to that out here, but I ain't heard plumb out to the sign the wind in the right direction. It's rank. And now I know that's not the best quality audio, but that last statement, it's rank, really sums up how evil and unclean things are. They're rank. They're hard to defeat. They're not impossible to defeat, though. Just you actually have to pay the price of defeating them. And, of course, we, being humans, aren't capable of playing the ultimate price to defeat death. Christ, Jesus, did that on the cross. And it come at a serious price. Um, very serious price. Well, any final thoughts, Anthony, before we close? Yeah, I've got two uh, distinct ones. So um, the first one is concerning corruption. And so being around that, uh, that stink and that disgustingness for so long, um, which by the way, it did man, it permeated through the many bags also that we had sealed it up in. Yeah, there we was like to, hornets and stuff coming out of it. Like, how did they get there? We had to um, dig a hole, start a fire, burn it in the hole, and then cover it with dirt to, uh, and that's a lot of work to um, stop it from continuing to spread across pretty much the entire church's campus. I don't know if that's the proper way to say that. Well, but we took it a few few acres away. but um. In any case, so um, we had to do all that work just to make sure that it would stop spreading. And I, I, will, I will just say that even just being around it for so long and in such intensity, I was smelling it all the time for about a day. Just no matter where I was, no matter what I was actually smelling, I could smell strawberries and I, I would smell that same exact smell. It was like permanently imprinted on me. And I realized that's a lot how it is to be around evil. Whenever you're around evil, it's really, really difficult to tell what is evil and what is not. Um, you know, it's just like whenever you're around such a putrid smell, it's hard to tell afterwards what it is that smells good and what it is that smells bad. Well, even before when you're trying to find the problem... Like your body kind of adjusts to that horrific smell and it makes it really hard to locate. I know that's what took us so long to figure out exactly where it was is because, you know, after you're around it, you kind of get used to it a little bit, as gross as that is. And yeah, 
having having evil and sin in your mind, it makes it hard to be since to be able to actually judge that which is good. It it corrupts. And the other thing um, that this reminds me of also is a story in Zechariah. I forget which chapter it's in, but the sin and oh, it's in chapter five, I believe. But the sin in, and iniquity of Israel is taken away by two angelic women far away to the land of Shinar. And there's a house built for it. And the sin and iniquity, it's in a basket. The basket is brought into the house and a laden weight is put to cover over the basket. And so all this preparation is taken to defeat the wickedness and evil. Yeah. And in many ways, we experience that same exact thing with that possum. I mean, we tried to bag it up. I mean, we had like five or six bags on it. (laughs) And it was still, as uh, Brother George said, rank and out to this church sign. So that's bad. And um, right. <clears throat> the work that was necessary to do, we did have to build a house for it. And we did have to put it in a basket. And we did have to, seal to it up. Uh, put a laden weight over it. Yeah. It's almost <clears throat> literally the exact same. We had to dig a hole. We had to start the fire for it. And then we had to cover it with you know a nice layer of soil. And so um, that is really the amount of work necessary to truly defeat evil. But the thing is, is it evil is not born into creation. I know we we've in the past done some satirical things where we read from the Key of Solomon and rate some of the the spooks and creatures and demons, monsters, whatever you want to call them in there. But evil is unborn. It was not spoken into place. And just like you know, we can go and bury that situation. Another situation can like that can come up. And it's it's interesting how that manifests. It's not hey, it doesn't even exist in the permanent sense, but it exists kind of temporarily wherever the, the conditions are right. It's it's part of fallen creation now. It's strange. But anyways, any other final thoughts, Anthony, before we close? All right. Well, we hope you had some meaningful lesson from this. Um we'll be looking more at the devil in the wilderness with the Gospel of Matthew here in a couple of weeks. But with that, we'll go ahead and close for today. God love you and have a blessed day.